He is a two-time Bassmaster winner, once in the Opens, once on the Bassmaster Elite Series, a two-time Bassmaster Classic qualifier, and he recently made the ballsy decision to step away from the Bass Pro Tour and try to once again qualify for the Bassmaster Elite Series. JVD, Jonathan Van Dam, joins me this week on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all, friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks, and of course my humpers. Welcome into the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. This is the 189th edition of the Mercer Podcast, and I'm so thankful that you guys have chosen to tune into this particular brand of tomfoolery that happens each and every Wednesday putting hump back in your hump day. It is a great week, a very special week in the United States of America. Wednesday is Thanksgiving Eve, and tomorrow, obviously, Thanksgiving. So happy Thanksgiving to all our U.S. viewers, our listeners. However you consume this show, we are thankful for you. Obviously, Thanksgiving was about a month and a half ago in Canada, and we celebrated that and obviously gave our fine Canadian viewers a shout-out. But here's the deal with me. I got a lot to be thankful for. I also am lucky enough to spend a good portion of my year working in the United States of America. And third, I don't need an excuse to eat turkey and watch football. So we celebrate both Thanksgivings in our house. So it will be a very happy Thanksgiving and um, it will be Thanksgiving times two for us. One of the things I am so thankful for is you guys tuning into this show each and every week, to literally supporting everything that I've been lucky enough to do throughout my career, whether it be the facts fishing TV show, this, the tips, the underwater stuff. You guys are so incredible, and I thank you for that. One of the ways we've begun to thank you guys is, well, making it rain prizes. And last week, we had a big contest for the Avco Reaper prize pack, and I'm proud to let you know our Contest winner has been chosen. It is Bass Tamer. Bass Tamer, congratulations. AFCO will be in touch. I believe they've already been in touch to get you your prize pack, and you will love it. So congratulations, Bass Tamer. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for supporting this contest. And I get it what the rest of you are thinking. Well, I didn't win again. Guess what? You got another shot to win. But we're changing it up. We've got a different prize here this week. The fine folks from BKK Hooks, well, they made it rain. And what they're going to make it rain is this right here. Let me show you this bad boy. This is their OCD collection of hooks. And you see how many packages of hooks are in there. But it's all different styles. You got your drop shot hooks. You got your permalocks. You got your flipping hooks you got treble hooks you got everything in this package i believe this package is worth about 350 dollars so not only will it keep you organized you know you're fishing and you're like hey i need a drop shot hook boom there's your drop shot hooks well we need a smaller drop shot hook boom there they are it's a very very cool hook collection and it is the bkk ocd collection and here's how you're going to win. All you got to do is continue to do what you guys have been so good in doing, and that is helping me stroke the algorithm. Because if the algorithm doesn't want this show to be cool, it won't be cool no matter how hard I try. And one way to keep the algorithm happy is make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. I mean, when people say that, people say it so much that you're like, ah, it's like you don't even hear it. You know, it's just, it's weird. But it does work. So how are you going to win that BKK prize pack is all you got to do is make sure you like this video, you're subscribed to this channel, which of course you are, and you leave a comment. But in said comments, you have to put BKK hooks at some point. Um, can be the beginning, the end, anywhere. If it says BKK hooks in the comment, you are entered and we will pick a winner next week. $350 worth of BKK hooks. Trust me, they are freaking spectacular. I mean, so, some of the cool things, like there's so many cool little adjustments and different things that they've done. And if I was better at my job, 
I would have got these out earlier and kind of been prepped to talk about them, but I'm not better at my job. I mean, this is the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast, and this is the awkward part of it. But I'm going to show you one of the things that I really love about it. They're heavy cover flipping hooks, and I didn't know this for years. I had been using a flipping hook, and every flipping hook right now, it's pretty much the standard that they have a bait keeper, that little barb that goes there. The BKK one is really small. And when I first thought saw that, I was like, yeah, I think I like a bigger bait keeper on my flipping hook. I was so wrong, because as I started to use it, I started to realize that the thinner one actually holds your worm better. A thicker holder rips the worm more in the way, and so it actually makes it move around a lot more. It's little things like that that make these hooks so badass. And if you want to win this prize pack, make sure to, you know, put BKK hooks in your comment. Simple, easy. Before we get into our guest, and we have a great guest, I want to talk about a comment. And I reach, read every single one of them. Every single one. First of all, let me close this pack. Because I, you know what happens. I mean, everybody has had a Plano box fall off the deck of their boat that was open and poof, it's everywhere. So I wanted to close that before I ended up with hooks everywhere. But um, I read every single comment that you guys sent. I try to get back to every single one. And every once in a while, a comment will come um, that really moves me. And this comment came from um, a father and his daughter that watch each and every week. And I am so thankful for that. They are from Black Mountain, North Carolina. And they said, obviously, they're dealing with the floods that happened a while ago. I mean, it's amazing that they've already disappeared from the news. But that trouble is still happening. So many people are affected in that part of the world. And uh, his comment was, you know, we're dealing with a lot of horrible crap. But once a week, him and his daughter make sure to listen to this show. And it is a bright spot in their week. So I am so thankful for that. That, that this show is a bright spot for somebody who truly, truly deserves it and needs it. And I am thankful for that. And I just wanted to say thank you publicly. And, and I wanted to encourage everyone to continue to pray for those people, continue to support those people in whatever way you can. Because while we all have so much to be thankful, many people are dealing with... Um, horrific things. And when we celebrate the good times, don't forget about those that, um, that are dealing with some tough times and, um, it doesn't seem powerful enough at all, but honestly, my thoughts and prayers are with all of you. Now I get it that, that again, might not mean anything to anybody, but it freaking means the world to me. Thank you. Now on to our guest, a guy who I've known for a very, very long time. Um, it's no, it's no um, secret that I'm very close with the Van Dam family. I've been to a lot of family functions. I always joke that uh, I'm DVD, an obsolete technology, but this guy is JVD. And uh, Jonathan Van Dam, obviously a former Elite Series champion, former Bassmaster Open winner, a couple of classics he's qualified for. But he is doing, uh, he's not the only one doing it. There seems to be more and more every year. But he, um, several years ago, he left with the uh, big split, went and fished the Bass Pro Tour. And he is slinging his sack over his shoulder. He has walked away from that. He has signed up for the Bassmaster Opens in a quest to qualify and get back to the Bassmaster Elite Series. And man, it is tough to do that under any stand, you know, situation, but even tougher when you're leaving a secure spot that you have at the Bass Pro Tour. Um, so we're going to talk to Jonathan Van Dam about all that and so, so much more. I hope you enjoy this. Let's travel to Kalamazoo, Michigan, deep within the bowels of DNR Sports, one of my favorite independent retailers. Um, shout out to everyone at DNR Sports. And we're going to go to johnny's office where I, I don't know if any real work happens there but he, he professes that it does the one and only jonathan van dam johnny van dam we're living in good times if you're a chiefs fan 
<laughs> or a Detroit Lions fan. That's right. How do we, how do our two teams have the best record? And I know it sounds horrible coming from the Chiefs because we have had a bad, a good, you know, last six seven years. But <laughs> uh, I mean, dude, ten years ago, if I'd have said to you the Chiefs and the Lions will be atop the ladder halfway through the season and looking to go to the Super Bowl, and I, there's lots of football to happen in between now and then. Um, yeah, I mean, but it's there is, but... awesome. Yeah, it's a it's a good uh, it's a good time to be a Lions fan. It's a good it's it's been a good time to be a Chiefs fan, but you know right now it's uh, it's looking like that's going to be those are the two teams you know odds on favorites right now. Yeah, well, lots lots can change, um, and nothing is guaranteed. Uh, you guys got very close last year to making a Chiefs Lions Super yeah. Bowl. Do you, are you guys going to finally stop booing Stafford when he comes home? I, like, I feel like you should cheer him because that trade turned out to be the greatest trade in Lions history. It did. And, like, dude, I've always been a Stafford fan. So, like, I went to the first game where it was, like, his first time back to Ford Field since he got traded. And it was uh, it was pretty awesome. But, man, the Lions fans, sometimes they're just a little – they're brutal. Like, you know how much – blood sweat and tears Stafford put into that team and that city and all that stuff like I mean you can't have anything but respect for him and like I, that's how I believe that all the Lions fans are but you know when you're coming to Ford Field it's a hostile environment when you're the away team it should be it should be that's your team's job I mean that's what I think is cool about football that like you know how a home field advantage is really a freaking home field advantage there's a lot of other sports oh, yeah. where that they, you mean you want them to cheer? You say a home field advantage, but it's just comfort. But in football, they can actually change the game. Um, so yeah. the Lions should be as loud as they can get because they didn't have a lot to say for a long time. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> so, do you believe when you qualify for the Bassmaster Elite Series for a smooth segue that you'll get booed when you cross the stage? <laughs> 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 I don't think so, man. I don't think so. But there's always that chance there might be someone here or there. But, um, you know, I don't know, dude. I'm excited. Yeah. No, it's uh, – obviously, I'm only joking. Nobody gets booed in fishing. <laughs> like, even the people that should get booed. Right. Don't get booed. Nobody gets booed. <laughs> I mean, maybe if I bring, like, a, you know, like a small women of one-pounders to start out with or something like that. They'll, they'll still cheer for you. They'll still cheer. This decision – um how long have you been because it's not easy dude like what you're doing like it's not like if you unqualified from mlf and you had to be you were qualified you didn't yeah. have to make this decision but to take your foot off first base to try and steal second can be scary and and True. probably doesn't get any easier as you as you age and you have you know kids that are the age of your kids and that sort of thing so how long has this been toiling around in your head Man, it's been been kind of toiling with it for the last last little while, you know. And it was just kind of one of those deals where we're going to wait and see what happened this year with uh, you know MLF cutting down the number of anglers that it was going to have, and and uh, you know being requalified for that. It was a big decision, but the, and the bottom line of it, and the, the grand scheme was, is like the classic played a huge part on that. I want to get I fished two of them. I want to get back to that so bad and i think every angler that fishes competitively i mean that's the ultimate you know goal um but at the same time you know just trying to do what's best for me and my family um you know as far as you know everything that we've got going on my kids are uh, six years old about to be seven and five years old so i mean they're in school and uh, my wife's working i'm obviously working here at the shop um, at, at my family's business, you know, when I'm not traveling. So, I mean, all that went into, uh, you know, went into the decision, uh, you know, bottom line, just trying to make the best decision for, uh, you know, my family and, and myself going forward and, and just trying to do the, the best that I can to, you know, just, just represent the sport and represent, you know, my sponsors and everybody the, the best that I can, um, you know, and I, and I really felt like, uh, you know, it was it was time to you know kind of slide back and try to make it back to the elite series and and uh, you know back to the classic. You know, and that's that was like I said the one of the biggest things weighing on me for sure was just really really wanting to get back to the classic. You know, after after fishing a couple of them, that that feeling just never leaves you. I imagine even more so for you because I don't think I've ever asked you this, but 
I got to believe being a fan in those stands, watching your uncle do, you know, most people that do what you do for a living, they had to convince their whole family, like, no, this is really a job. People do well at this. You didn't have to do that part, but I would imagine, you know, just the feeling that you have in that arena is tenfold because it goes back to literally being a little kid watching your uncle win that yeah. event. No, it does. I mean, I, man, I, I don't think the first classic that I attended was in 1994. Um, I still got pictures of me toting around a, a, a big giant tackle box that was, you know, glittered up like a, like a bass boat, to be honest with you. And I've got pictures of that. I don't have the tackle box anymore, but um, you know, I mean, that was my first classic and I've been to many, many, many of them. I've got to watch, you know, uncle Kevin win, you know, multiple of them. And, um, you know, I actually practiced with them, uh, you know, years ago for the one in Pittsburgh, we went in pre-practice uh, and he ended up winning that. And we went down there for the tournament too. So, I mean, just, there's a lot of great memories that are in those stadiums and, and, um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, got to witness a lot of really cool things. Um, you know, obviously, uh, like our whole family's close. We're all super, super proud of everything that my uncle's accomplished. Um, so, yeah, I mean, trying to convince, uh, you know, like you said, trying to convince my family to, I wanted to fish professionally was, <laughs> wasn't that hard, you know, but, uh, yeah, I mean, just, just all the, all the memories and, and, uh, you know, all the, the, you know, good things that have happened, uh, you know, to our family because of bass fishing over the years. Um, you know, it really, really is, uh, you know, that weighs heavily on your mind. And that was a, also, you know, a big consideration as, as to far, as far as what decisions were made. Are you nervous? I am a little bit, you know what I mean? Cause there's a part of me that's thinking like, okay, well, what's going to happen if I, if I don't make it back, you know, it's a big step. I just, I gave up a, you know, arguably a major league position, you know, to go back to the minor leagues, you know, and, and I say that, you know, realistically, like the opens aren't necessarily minor leagues. Like these dudes are hammers. Like there's a lot of really, really good fishermen out there. Um, a lot of former elite series guys, a lot of current elite series guys. So it's, I mean, the competition is fierce. Um, but, and that's how it should be, you know, when you're trying to make it to that top level. Yeah. It, I mean, I, and I guess when you say minor league, when anyone says minor league, I mean, it's, that's the way it's perceived from sponsors. Sure. That's the way it's yeah. perceived in contracts where people have to, you have to be fishing this tour or this tour. And the opens is a step down, but not yeah. in competition. It's just a step down in where sponsors rate it, you know, the right. public perception. Um, yeah. the, there's a case to be made that the opens are harder to compete in today than, than anything that's out there. It, it, uh, so you, so what are you doing? One division? You're doing one full division, right? Yeah, right now I signed up for one division, the Division Two. So uh, Sam Rayburn, Kentucky Lake, Norfolk, and Leech Lake. Um, definitely going to try to jump in that St. Lawrence River <laughs> event too. The last one of the the first division. Um, you know, I kind of I kind of looked at that, and as far as like how looking at those divisions, if it made sense to fish both of them or not. Um, you know, like fishing both of them now really didn't accomplish, you know, or, or, or help you out too much. Uh, you know, just the way that the, the format is changing from, you know, where they had nine tournaments, you had the EQs, you had to fish all nine of them. Um, you know, honestly, in my mind, that probably would have been a lot easier of a qualification road. For me personally, just with all the experience I have fishing all over the country uh, over the last 15 years, you know, you can't really um, you can't really argue that as far as like that's helpful for sure yeah. to have that. Um, so but now with the, you know, you need to be in the top 50 in points. So and, and you still need to have three more tournaments after that. So regardless if you fish both of them or not, like if you're in the top 50 of both of them, it doesn't really help you out. Yeah, necessarily. You know what I mean? So the goal is just to get in the top 50 and then, right. And then let the cards then fall where they down. may, you know, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta hammer down in those. Right. I, I agree with you though. Like when I, when I looked at it, I'm like, I think this, this makes it harder in some ways than nine events. 
I mean, it, it opens the door, I think, for certain ways. Like if somebody, you know, has a job and they're looking to get weeks off, it is a little easier. Sure. But uh, I personally, I mean, I, I thought we got through the nine and that we were clearly they were good anglers in oh, yeah. both the new groups of nine that have qualified. And I thought I, I was shocked that they actually changed it. But um, change seems to be the one thing we can guarantee in the bass fishing world lately. Yeah, that yeah, that's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. That's yeah, some good change, some frustrating. It's just it's been uh, it's, it's been an interesting a uh, couple of years in the world of bass fishing. It definitely has. It definitely has. Um, obviously, forward-facing sonar, a big player. Where are you at with that? Are you, I feel like you're kind of foot on each side, one foot on the dock and one foot on the boat when it comes to that. Now, that's just what I'm guessing. Yeah, I mean, it's funny how that's evolved the last couple of years, just based on, you know, like previously, like I never really had, there was guys that were using it and I didn't have it at the time. Um, and then, you know, and you're just getting stomped by those guys that were, you know, out there scoping around. And uh, it's really, it's really interesting what it's done for, for our sport. And, and it's, you know, it's done some good things and some bad things in, in my opinion, but at the grand scheme of things, the, bottom line is is if you're able to use it you better have it and you better learn how to be proficient with it otherwise you know you're, you're not going to do very well i mean is it something that is a end-all be-all i don't think so i mean you still have your traditional you know fishing patterns and in seasonal um you know seasonal patterns that are going to affect how you're going to approach different bodies of water but you know after using it and then it's like all of a sudden, like if it doesn't work for some reason or or you're in a place like where it doesn't really apply as much, you're like, man, you don't really know what to do because you're constantly used to looking down, trying to figure out. And, and I use it more as a like a tool to aid what I'm already working on um, necessarily without necessarily relying on it exclusively. So um, there's a lot of ways to do it. And there's a lot of guys that are really good and that just exclusively rely on only that. Like if you put yeah. them somewhere without it, they would have a hard time. They would struggle a little more than they normally would. But, um, you know, it's a, it's one of those tools and this technology that's available. So you, in order to compete, you have to be proficient with it and you have to become familiar with it and how the fish act and, and use it as a tool to help, you know, to help your success. Here's something I just thought of while you were talking about this. You're probably one of the few guests that can actually answer this with an educated answer, not to insult our previous guests. But one of the big things that you hear about forward facing sonar is, man, nobody is selling crankbaits. There's none, you know, it's totally changed the way sales are. Yeah. I mean, obviously your day job at DNR, I mean, you have a real good perception. What are you seeing? It definitely has affected the sales, you know, overall sales numbers of, of different types of lures. There's no doubt about it. I mean, we sell more jerk baits, more minnows and jig heads and stuff like that now. Um, I mean, I think it, it kind of goes regionally uh, in a lot of cases as well. Like, um, like our region with smallmouth fishing and Lake St. Clair being so close. I mean, it is a big time player. Um, Huge. Now we're still, I mean, there's guys are still fishing the normal stuff. Like they have a, you know, rotational arsenal of like crankbaits and, you know, chatterbaits and different things that they're still utilizing, but not to the same extent that they were. And there's definitely a, a large group of guys that are exclusively, they're pretty much only buying stuff for forward facing. Um, so it definitely has had an effect on the tackle sales as far as, uh, you know, what people are buying, rods, reels, all the above. Um, and it's definitely, it's been a noticeable shift, but, you know, there's consistently been, you know, different bait designs and developments and stuff like that, that, you know, that we also may not have had if it wasn't for this, you know, for forward facing sonar also. So, I mean, while crankbaits might be suffering a little bit, you know, the jerk baits have picked up some of that slack. Um, you know, and then some of these new new baits and new designs on things, uh, you know, are also kind of picking it up. So I feel like it evens out uh, to a certain extent, but there's definitely um, you just see a shift in, in what people are buying. I mean, 
guys are still, let's be honest, <laughs> you know, Dave, you can't go into a, a Bass Pro or any tackle store without buying something, you know, at being a fisherman. So, um, you know, guys are still getting tackle and rods and reels and stuff like that and trying different techniques. Um, but it's, there's a shift, you know, that's been happening. You guys have always been a very nimble retailer though i think like and what i mean by that is being on top of the shift like the, yeah. there's several independent stores you guys being one of the marks in alabama being yeah. one of them there's a bunch of like which i thought are, are real thought leaders in the industry like it, quite often the big boxes i think follow you guys have you guys made a shift with that you know like obviously you're selling more of some so it's not as simple as just stocking more being prepared for that and it has, you've definitely had to make make a change if, if you're going to keep making those sales i would imagine yeah i mean one of the one of the things that we've done is obviously bringing in different baits um you know whether it's like a um oh obviously right now like the depths um Sakamata Shad, some of those, like we never had those in the past yeah. before that, you know, but that's the beauty of like what we're able to do as an independent dealer is we we're able to specialize for uh, our area and, you know, get the right stuff in, you know, we've got our online store too, but like we, we try to stay on, on top of the curves and, and being a part of the fishing industry and fishing these tournaments and, and seeing like what guys are doing on the water at these major tournaments that are getting, coverage and stuff like that. I mean, it's definitely a big advantage. Uh, you know, I can see some of that stuff ahead of time. Cause a lot of times, you know, how, you know, how the anglers are like, they like to keep things secret as long as possible. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, you're, we're able to be in at the actual event, able to sniff some of that stuff out ahead of time. Um, but we, we've, you know, added a lot of different, uh, different lures and, and, jig heads and jerk baits and stuff that you know normally maybe we wouldn't have you know but because of forward facing you know being an independent retailer you're able to make those changes quicker um you know i mean don't get me wrong like bass pros they're working on they're doing the same stuff um you know they just they have so many more stores and so many more balls rolling at once that it just takes a little bit more time uh, you know, for that to happen. But like I was at uh, uh, Bass Pro last week in Florida. And I mean, they had even in Florida, they had some of the <laughs> some of the forward facing. So you see more jerk baits and in, in uh, you know, minnows or whether it's the uh, like the Crush City stuff or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, you know, even some of the like the power bait minnows, um, all those different types that you would probably wouldn't normally see in Florida. Um, but you know, they had some, which, you know, even in, even in Florida, when you're thinking you're fishing heavy cover frog and flipping, uh, winding a trap or a bladed jig, you know, they, they, that technique still plays down there to a certain extent too. All right. Let's, let's get to talking about you and your career. Do you think it's going to be harder to qualify for the elite series this time or the last time you qualified? Uh, you know, I think this time is going to be harder than, than what it was last time. You know, like the first, uh, the first few years fishing the opens, trying to qualify like the, my, the first year I didn't do very great. The second year I missed it by one place and the third year I made it. Um, so it took me three years then now I don't, you know, I didn't know as much then I was learning a lot at the time. I didn't, I didn't have as much knowledge and experience as I do now, but with the same token what that is is information so readily available you've got live coverage you've got you know youtube you've got all these different things magazines still um you know articles just everything's at the tip of your fingers and so the learning curve is so much shorter now and some of these kids especially like you're looking at the high school programs and the college programs like these guys are coming out into the opens like ready to roll like They've had some experience. They've, they've, you know, done a ton of research. They're familiar with their electronics. They, they don't have as much of that learning curve, uh, you know, like what we had years ago. Um, so, I mean, I really feel like it's going to be, it's going to be tougher for sure. Do you have a timetable in your head? Like I'm going to give this two years, three years, four years. 
Uh, not, I don't really necessarily. Um, I mean, two years is kind of the goal. I mean, I feel like, I mean, the goal is to, the goal is to come out next year and make it, you know, yeah. obviously, um, that's number one goal, but it's, it's, you know, definitely not out of the question, but it's, it's fairly lofty, you know, like these guys are, like I said, these guys are good. And I, and I truly believe that I can, I can do it for sure. I feel like I'm as good as anybody out there. Um, so, uh, you know, two years was kind of what my thought process was, but I'd love to just make it happen in one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it'd be a lot less <laughs> stressful anyways. Yeah, yeah. But you see the guys that are trying to do it and the and the guys who have gotten so close. And, it, I mean, it's it's not a gimme. And, and I think, like you said, I, I mean, now you got to have those three great fall tournaments to qualify yeah. ultimately, which means you can't, I mean – people can be like, well, there's less events, so it might be easier, but it's also harder because you can't recover. Like if you have in those three events, I imagine if you have one bad day, it's over. Right. Yeah. So I think, honestly, I think that I'm pretty pumped about those fall tournaments, you know, because, man, we just, <clears throat> we haven't had big tournaments in the fall in a long time. And that's some of the most fun, some of the best fishing uh, you know, and like, you never really know, like I would, I would imagine that those events will kind of start somewhere in September and maybe run through early November. I don't, I don't really know, um, per se, but you still have some Northern fishery options in there being in September, you know, which, you know, how it is up here in the fall, it's unreal how good the fishing is. Um, so, and, you know, on top of that, it also <clears throat> gives, uh, you know, a lot of guys might not have as much experience fishing different locations in the fall that, that they wouldn't otherwise. Um, Cause even a lot of the local tournament trails and stuff are done by now. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting. It'll be an interesting time to see, but you know, I'm looking forward to it. Fall. I absolutely love fall fishing. There's some of the most fun, um, you know, fish are aggressive. Top water is always a player, which is a blast, you know, so it'll, It'll be interesting. It's it's hard to say. You know, it's hard to say not knowing you <laughs> right off. Anyways, are you gonna have a hard time getting used to going back to five fish? I mean, you did have your year where it was a thing, but for the most part, <laughs> um, it it has been. It's been a numbers game. It, yeah, it has been. I don't. I don't think so. I've. I've uh, even. Uh, you know, even with the every fish counts format, I've still. I don't feel like I've fished any different, you know, maybe to a certain extent, but I've always done better in a five fish format. Um, you know, I, I've like this last year, I caught a lot of really, like a lot of really big fish. You know, I had big bass at a tournament and two tournaments, I think, uh, this year, if I remember right. But it was, you know, I, I like, uh, I like the five fish. I'm looking forward to it. Um, <clears throat> I'll be honest with you, I'm not really looking forward to having a cohen wear in my boat. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, but aside from that, uh, five fish is, you know, that's how I've grown up fishing. That's how, that's how it's been done for years and years and years. And, and that's, you know, I'm honestly really looking forward to it. I feel like it's going to be a whole heck of a lot less stressful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you won't have a, uh, somebody telling you what, where you need to be. Um, I mean, both sides, I think, give different, you know, there's that added stress of a cut line. But I always say with the five fish, it's cool to see, like, I look at some iconic wins in the past. Rick Clunn's wins on the St. John's River. Yeah. Like, I'm like, okay, so is that better under five fish or every fish? Because under every fish, most likely Cliff Prince wins it catching three pounders on a shell bed all day. Right. You, you know what I mean? Like, it does, yep. it, it both, I mean, both push you and um i mean if you fish both are appealing i would imagine um how long has it been since you've had a co-angler <laughs> i think it's been probably a decade at least yeah at least a decade you know i think i'm going on uh, i don't even know oh, 2010 or 11 i believe was my first year on the elite series so wow since then <laughs> So more than a it's been, it's been a long time, you know, but honestly, like, I, you know, I enjoyed, uh, you know, I enjoyed the opens and stuff and I, I enjoyed having, 
uh, you know, co-anglers and marshals and, uh, you know, stuff like that. It's just, it's fun to, you know, especially if something cool happens, you know, um, now it, it is going to be a little bit more, uh, a little different as far as having somebody actually fishing in the back of your boat, but, uh, you know, usually that's my dad that's back there. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you think the fact that you came on this podcast and said you weren't looking forward to having a co-angler will make it even more awkward having a co-angler? <laughs> no, you know, you, you, Dave, I, I told you I'd come on here and I, I wouldn't hold nothing back. I'll tell you exactly how I'm feeling uh, about everything. And, um, you know, it's, yeah, straight up just, and I, I remember, you know, like I remember in the back of my mind, like, the defense game when it comes to having a co-angler in the back of your boat, just like boat positioning is completely different. Everything is just completely different than what it, you know, what I'm used to, I guess. Um, I mean, you might not be able to ideally position the boat the way you want to without opening up your area to somebody else to throw in. But you know, that's part of the game. I mean, for the most part, everyone that's out there has the same issues. So, um, you know, and that like forward facing sonar, obviously like it's gotta be dang tough to be a co-angler nowadays, you know, with forward facing. And, um, I would, I would have a hard time with it to be honest with you. Yeah. That, that's not easy. What, uh, what's the reaction been like with your business partners, your sponsors? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been overwhelmingly positive, you know, the, they're a hundred percent supportive. Um, you know, and, and there's definitely, uh, there's some excitement on all fronts trying, uh, you know, trying to get back to the elite series. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, it's just overall, everyone's been super supportive and, you know, that's all I could really ask for, you know, I, and I've, you know, tried to have great relationships with all my sponsors and in the grand scheme of things, like try to do as much as I could. So, uh, you know, realistically, it didn't really matter where I fished exactly. Um, but you know, then that's, like I said, all I can ask for is just, you know, the great relationships that I've made over the years. Um, you know, and then the, the companies are, you know, they're supporting me and, and, uh, backing me no matter what I decided to do. Do you remember the moment when it clicked in your head and you're like, man, this is, this is, I got to figure out a way to do this for a living. Do, do you have one of those moments or was it just like, well, I'm, I'm JVD. I might as well do this. <laughs> no, I don't, I, I can't say, uh, there was one moment for sure. Um, like when I was 16, I traveled with, uh, Kevin, my cousin and I, we went to Champlain. We went to Oneida a few times and fished as co-anglers when they had co-anglers on the elite series. And, um, you know, got a real taste of what it was like at that point. And in the back of my mind, it was always like, man, I'm not knowing if I could compete with some of these guys. You know, I looked up at, you know, all these guys like Aaron Martins and obviously like Uncle Kevin, you, um, Ken Cook, you know, so guys that I fished with over the years and like, you know, Rick Cohen, I'm legends of the sport that I grew up watching. And, and, uh, you know, in my mind, I'm like, man, these guys are, you know, amazing, unbelievable fishermen. I don't, you know, like coming from Michigan and not having much experience down South, uh, and, you know, doing well locally, you're like, okay, like, I feel like I'm ready to take the next step, but you don't really know. And it, it the, the, when it really clicked for me, the first, uh, very first, open that I fished was at the St. John's river and, uh, I was leading going in the last day. And at that point, uh, and I, dude, at that point, I knew nothing about Florida, whether it was sight fishing or like just really anything like tidal, you know, tidal fisheries. And I did, had no idea what I was doing. I was as about as green as they could get. Um, and you know, somehow managed to be leading going in the last day. I, and, um, you know, at that point, after that tournament, uh, it was really in my mind where I felt like, okay, well, I can do this. You know, I had, it was a big boost of confidence that, that I could, uh, you know, compete, uh, you know, on some of these big Southern reservoirs and I could figure out, um, you know, could figure out the fish. What's your favorite part about being a professional angler? Oh man, that's, you know, honestly, a lot of people, uh, my by far my favorite part is just all the amazing people that I've met over the years, whether it's, you know, the guys that I've roomed with, um, you know, the, 
the other anglers and friendships there and, and, you know, people I've met all over the country, fans and, and, you know, other people that I've become friends with. And it's, that's one of the coolest things about our sport is, is no matter what level you are or where you're at with it, you know, everybody loves the same thing and uh, they're passionate about it. And I've had, I mean, some of my best friends on earth are because of, you know, professional bass fishing. Yeah. How tough is it going to be to not room? I mean, you've roomed with Casey and Marty yeah. and obviously Kevin was part of that. And then he went and retired, but right, uh, right. how tough is it going to be? Are, do you know who you're rooming with? Have you, I, I don't know yet. I've got a couple of feelers out there. Um, we've got one of my buddies that uh, I grew, grew up with his family. He fished the, the opens the last few years. Um, probably stay with him a little bit. And, uh, and I've got a couple other friends, uh, one of my buddies from Iowa. And I don't, so I don't really know exactly who I'm going to stay with, which is a weird feeling because, uh, you know, the last 15 years, honestly, more than that, because I roomed with Marty and Casey and them, even when I was fishing the opens, uh, before I qualified for the elite series. So, um, yeah, that's gonna, that's gonna be tough for sure. You know, those guys have, some of my best friends and uh i'm gonna miss fishing with them and and traveling with them just all the stories and and stuff like that it's gonna be it's gonna be a little different for sure um you know gonna be tough did they give you any advice any parting thoughts when you told them <laughs> what you were doing <laughs> no no they didn't um you know i talked with them about it and uh you know it's just uh they they were kind of in the same boat as I was, just kind of trying to de decide what to what to do, um, you know, going forward as well, and and just making the decisions that are best for our families. And and uh, they, I mean, they obviously like we wish each other the best as possible, no matter what you know where we're fishing, what we're doing. Uh, I'm still going to talk to them, you know, kind of like what Kevin did when he retired. He'd still call every single tournament just to see what was going on. You know, he can't, uh, can't, just can't get away from it, you know? So I'm, you know, obviously still going to be rooting for those guys. I mean, they're my brothers basically. So, um, it's going to be, it's going to be weird, but you know, overall, like we all kind of talked about it and, and made, made, uh, whatever the best decisions we felt like were, uh, you know, for us at the time and whatever, you know, scenario life had at, at the moment. And that was just kind of, kind of part of it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, you got to do what's right for you. Do, I would imagine that the challenge being as great as it is, is also motivating too. Like, I mean, if you look at your career at the Bass Pro Tour, I mean, you were pretty settled, you know what I mean? Not, But you know what I mean? You were pretty content. I mean, obviously you try to win every single week, but now you're like, I mean, it's like when somebody says, I'm going to climb that hill that nobody can, I mean, it, what you're trying to do is not easy. Does the lack of ease motivate you more? It, it does. Honestly. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, I, honestly, like, I feel like those just the last few years, um, and probably like the last five years, you know, no, not even really maybe four years is when I've really felt like I've like kind of hit my stride. You know, I've always like, been been like very much an up and down angler like had you know and that i think that was just partially you know because of you know lack of experience and and different things but like i know it's not going to be easy it, and it is it is especially like at this stage of my life like super motivating for me to get back to that level um you know like i said in the classic having been there and knowing what that feels like uh you know i like I know that I know it's a big mountain that I'm fixing to start a journey up, but, uh, you know, I mean, I feel like I put my head down, like I'm fishing as good as I ever have. Um, I feel great about my on the water decision-making, uh, the, and being able to make adjustments and turn a not so great, uh, event into something, you know, something good and, or manageable, you know what I mean? And not having those, uh, you know, big catastrophic, you know, 90 place finishes, uh, consistency obviously is always key. Um, but you know, like I said, just where my, where my headspace is now, you know, like I, 
everything at home's fantastic. You know, I'm working at the store. I got, you know, beautiful wife, two amazing children. Um, you know, so everything's just kind of settled. And I feel like that that's motivated me, especially the last, you know, four years or so. And, uh, you know, I feel like my fishing, you know, abilities and my decision making and, and reading the water and reading everything that's happening in front of me, I feel like is as good as it's ever been. Probably, you know, so I've got a ton of confidence, uh, you know, going into this that I can compete with anybody no matter where it is, when it is. You won pretty early in your career, obviously, in the elites. I mean, it, it came pretty quick. Do you feel um, – I mean, you take a win whenever it comes. I mean, they're hard, it's hard enough to win, so you'll take it whenever. I mean, not that you – but do you think that win early in your career, good thing, bad thing, or it just happened when it was supposed to happen? Yeah, you know, that's kind of one of the, one of the things with uh, – with, when it comes to – that I've learned, I guess, over the years when it comes to winning a tournament, like when it's your time, it's your time. Like you're going to make the right decisions. Things are going to go right. And, and it's going to happen. You can't force it. You know, I've, I found I tried too many times early on and, uh, you know, to try to force a win or something that I really felt like I could. And, and then in the grand scheme of things, it ends up, you know, you, you don't end up winning and, it, and it's, it, it's just it's not hard, not easy to win one of these events, no matter what it is, whether it's an open or bass pro tour or anything at this high level. Um, you know, it's just difficult. It, it really is. And but when it's your time, it's your time. You're going to make the right decisions and it's going to happen. I feel like uh, it, looking back on it, there's I feel like I've made a lot of silly decisions at times, um, you know, especially especially in positions where I had a chance to win one. Um, but, you know, learning from those mistakes and being able to apply them going forward. I mean, it's, it's really tough. Uh, you know, but like I said, I feel like when it's your time to win one, it, everything's going to fall into place and, uh, you know, you'll make the decisions, you'll get the right bites and, and you just, you just, you know, it's kind of one of those things I feel like you just can't stop it when it's meant to be. Was there any tough parts about starting a career in this sport? with the last name Van Dam. I mean, everybody points out the positives, but I got to imagine there was, that's also a giant friggin' target you're painting on your back. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, it was, there was some difficult aspects to it. Um, I mean, I would say more so than not, there was a, you know, it was overwhelming amount of support. Everybody wanted to see another, another Van Dam succeed and, and do well. And, but there was still like an expectation of, like, Hey, like you're a Van Damme, you need to perform. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, there was definitely a, a little bit of that, but no, not, there really wasn't a whole lot of negatives. Um, and honestly, probably the biggest one was just myself in my expectation that I felt like I needed to, you know, try to try to hold up to that level of, you know, of success, which, I mean, and I look at back at it now, which was, it was, it's just silly, honestly. Cause like, I mean, it's the, it, uncle Kevin's the greatest of all time. He's paved the way for everybody. I mean, he was the tiger woods of bass fishing, paved the way for the sport to be what it is, grew it tremendously over the years. And, um, you know, and it was unrealistic expectation of myself to feel like that, you know, I needed to be winning tournaments constantly and doing, uh, doing as well as him and being there for angler of the year. And like now at this point, I look at him like, man, if I can have a career that's half as good as what he's done, like it'll still be one of the greatest careers out of the anglers have had. So, I mean, it's, it's, a it's a pretty cool, um, you know, pretty cool thing really, honestly. And I've gotten past the aspect of, uh, you know, the expectations of, of, you know, being hard on myself um, and kind of, kind of made my own way, you know, through the sport a little bit as, and trying to, you know, figure out what type of angler I am, uh, yeah. you know, versus what I've learned from him and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been really cool, honestly. And, and the overwhelming support from the fans, obviously just with name recognition and stuff like that, um, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, no, it, and it's very cool. But I mean, it, it's, I, I, 
have always just looked at it and been like, man, that isn't easy. Like, I don't think it was easy, easy for Scott Martin to do what he does. You know what I mean? When your when your dad's Roland Martin, like it, it's it's hard for any angler to. I mean, the hardest thing you hear from every rookie is, oh, don't listen to Doc talk. You know, once I stopped <laughs> listening, I started doing better. But so that's hard for anybody. And there's no name connection to them. You know what I mean? It's just hard to uh, to find yourself as as a person I, I and i think that's normal in life like i, I don't sure. think it's abnormal i mean it's no different than working at the store you you know you want to put your stamp on the store too you know what i mean like you want right. to um make your dad proud and do different it's just normal to me but but i you know i could also imagine that it's a double-edged sword because I mean, if you don't do well it's like why didn't you do well your last name's van dam but if you do do well people will be like well of course right. he did well. He's he's Johnny Van Dam. I mean, everything was given right. to him on a platter, clearly, which I know is not the case. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, I've been doing it long enough now that, uh, you know, like the fan base is kind of, you know, and, and myself really, uh, like I've learned who I want to be and what type of angler I am and how to portray that message. And, and, and uh, you know, because you look at it like, you know, Aaron Martins is the greatest finesse fisherman of all time. You know, you like that type of that type of thing. You know, Uncle Kevin is not only the greatest angler of all time, but the greatest power fisherman of all time. You know, kind of everybody has their you know little niche within the uh, uh, the you know the sport of bass fishing is what that they are the most you know have the most success doing. Um, you know, so I feel like it's kind of. Uh, trying to figure that out is, was, was difficult at first because, you know, everyone just associated Van Dam with all oh, he's, you know, he's gotta be good at whining a crankbait. You know what I mean? Um, you know, when in all actuality, I'm kind of more of like a power finesse fisherman, uh, you know, like Nico rig drop shot, spinning around type stuff. Um, and you know, do better in those types of scenarios than I do cranking a 660 on Kentucky Lake, <laughs> you know? So, um, you know, being able to now at this point kind of separate that out a little bit and, and really uh, know what my strengths are and what I can rely on and can't rely on instead of, like you said, listening to that doc talk and trying to make the uh, make something work that, you know, I may not be super comfortable with. Um, you know, that makes a big difference when a successful, you know, successful tournament or not. I had Brad Hyde on this show, and as you know, you know you're going to be competing against with him at the yeah. Opens. Oh, Be Height! Everybody loves Be Height, but he said one of the biggest adjustments for him was boat ramps. He's like, I've spent the last few years, you know, competing against eighty guys, but only forty a day fished. He said oh, he would yeah. show up for the boat ramp like twenty minutes before, you know. Yeah. Now he says, <laughs> now the Opens, he said, like I've got to get up ridiculously early. Are you ready to get up ridiculously early? Man, I didn't think about that, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm definitely used to the the aspect of over the years. It's like, unhook your boat, drop it in the water, let it float away. Someone will give me a ride, you know, 10 minutes before we blast off. Yeah, this can be a little different. But, um, <laughs> you know, I the last few years, especially as probably as I've gotten a little older, um, you know, there was a there was a time when I fishing, you know, kind of early on in, in my elite series career where I was not the first one out of bed. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> but the last, the last few years, and I think it's just more of a motivational thing. And as far as like getting a little older and, and, and being, um, you know, having a family that relies on me doing well and, and putting the work in and, and just, just different motivation, I guess. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll get up as early as you need me to. <laughs> what, uh, this doesn't have to be specifically fishing. What's your biggest pet peeve in life? Man, that's a good question. What biggest grinds pet? your gears? Uh, man, that's a real good one. Honestly, the one, probably one of the, um, the, the biggest things for me is just, uh, like if someone tells me they're going to do something and then, you know, and then they don't do it, like, you know, like the, like the verbal handshake kind of thing, 
it, that is, that is one of my, one of my biggest, um, you know, biggest deals. Like if I, if I say something or commit to something, um, you know, I, I kind of, I've kind of, uh, have witnessed some of that a little bit now as I've gotten older and my kids and they like, they'll sign up for sports. And then all of a sudden they're like, I don't want to go to baseball today. I'm like, well, you sign up for it. You got to go. You know, that is, that was one of my biggest, biggest pet peeves. Like if someone signed up and committed to something and then it wasn't going well or they didn't enjoy it and then they would, they bail out, you know, I'd say it's definitely, uh, you know, a lot more of something that happens more frequently in this day and age, especially, but, uh, that's one of my biggest things is like seeing something through. And if you say you're going to do something, you commit to it and, and, uh, you know, make sure you see it through. Your word is your bond. Good, good way to live life. Whose guitar is that behind you? And can you play it? <laughs> I absolutely cannot play it. Oh, uh, you built me up. I was all set. To... I know I bought, I, I got that guitar at a, uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. And, uh, it's pretty sweet. They got a, they got it, had it signed up. It's got a Rocky Mountain Out Foundation, and it's signed by you know who's singing to this? No idea. No idea. Luke Combs. Oh dang, that's country pretty music strong. Artist. Yeah, well, his, I'm mean... big, big Luke Combs fan, big country music fan, and you know it's funny because they had this at a uh, at an auction, like a Rocky Mountain it's like silent auction deal, and they had it on there. But they had like whoever's signature that they had on there. They like it wasn't Luke Combs. And I looked at it and I'm like, well, that's Luke Combs signature. And they had some other person on there that had no idea who it even was. So nobody was bidding on it. I bought this thing for like 150 bucks. Dang. That's strong. <laughs> yeah. Strong. Wow. Yeah. No, Luke Combs. I think he listens to the show. Probably not, but yeah, um, maybe, who knows? maybe. But so now I just, you know, I hang it in my office as a, just, you know, as an office item. What do you do in that office? Do you do you actually do like if I yeah. look around that desk, is it is there a lot of work happening there today or what is happening well, in that office? Yeah, to be honest with you, Mercer, you'd be surprised what it normally looks like. I cleaned it for you. <laughs> oh nice. <laughs> so, so I cleaned it up. But no, we uh, I I do quite a bit. Um you know, especially with the, like the firearm side of our store. Uh, so there's a, a lot of, obviously a lot of paperwork involved. I do a lot of the buying for, um, you know, for pretty much guns, ammo. Uh, I help, help out with a lot of the fishing tackle, um, stuff like that. So uh, I do a little bit of everything, kind of a little bit, uh, you know, wherever I'm needed, you know, more than happy to, to help out. And that's kind of, you know, it's kind of how family businesses roll, wherever you can help out, you jump in and go for it. So. I mean, I did clean my office, so it does, it is, you know, it's going to stay like this now, but I mean, it, it looks wasn't like, like this like a couple hours ago. <laughs> it looks nice. It's well put together. Um, it, it's, mine's not as well put together as yours. It's very nice. Very nice. Um, what's the most embarrassing moment you've ever had in the history of your career as a professional angler? Oh, I've definitely, um, had my, I think it was Gunnersville, um, Gunnersville elite series event. And I forgot to put the plug in my boat and like, it was constantly pumping water out. I had to have my, uh, Marshall at the time, hold on to my legs as I went down underneath the boat. And I had <laughs> like, dude, I, cause I couldn't, it was one of those plugs that was like way up underneath. Like I didn't, they didn't have the little you know, the little switch like they do now where you can just flip it and be like, Oh yeah, no big deal. No, like I had to get under the boat and, and get it, get it plugged in there. So, um, I mean, that was a really good one. Uh, I can't say like I've really had anything like super embarrassing. Um, you know, I mean, probably had some funny moments, maybe some, you know, some little bit of <laughs> comical moments at the times, but, uh, you know, for the most, honestly, and that was like early in my elite series, like career. it might've been my first year to be a hundred percent honest with you. So it was more so of a, like hurt my pride thing than necessarily being outrageously embarrassing, but it, it, it definitely was yeah. in my mind. Uh, I mean, at the time it was probably very embarrassing, yeah. it, it, but it happens to everyone. I mean, I, I remind people, David Mullen sunk his truck. The first time he ever backed, he got his Marshall back in and sunk his truck at his first ever Elite Series event. So uh, that's not a good way to start. But uh, where are you five years, ten years from now? Do you are you one of those people who plans out? Like it, if everything goes according to plan, 
and we do a podcast 10 years from now, who is Jonathan Van Dam? Man, you know, like that's the hardest part about the about tournament fishing and in our industry and, and that aspect of it is because it's really hard to plan, <laughs> you know, especially that far in advance. Um, but I mean, you know, hopefully 10 years from now, I'm, you know, fishing the elite series and, you know, maybe have won a classic or two. You never know. How much does you watching your uncle, and now that you have kids that are of the age that now they're watching and absorbing, how much of that memory of sitting in those seats do you do you want for your kids to experience that? Or is that unrelated? You're just fishing where you're fishing. No, I would I would love for that, honestly. You know, the 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 last classic that I fished, I had Let's see. Yeah, it was the last classic that I fished. I had just met my wife at the time. So, like, we were freshly dating. She wasn't at the classic by any means. So, she has yet to, she has yet to witness a, you know, I think she's been to a couple of them, but it's not the same, like, when you're part of it. Yeah. Um, you know, sitting in the stands, it's really cool. But, like, when you're, when you're part of it and you're going to the dinners and all the, everything else that goes along with it. Um, you know, it's a totally different experience. It's like, you know, like nothing, it's, it's hard to explain. Um, but you know, like, and we've, you know, we've made a couple of other championships too, but it's just not, it's just not the classic, you know? So, she, and like my kids have been to, to some, a couple of those, but even, you know, even at you that can point, say their name, Johnny, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so my son's name is Matthew. No, and, no, um, I meant the name of the championships. Oh, yeah, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> so, yeah, anyways. But we've made a couple of red crests. Yeah. And it just it just isn't the same. Like it's it's a really well done event. Don't get me wrong. It is a yeah. it is a really well done event and it's um you know, it's but it's it's still just it's just not the classic. And it's, and it's, you know, that's, that was, like I said, was one of my biggest, um, you know, de decision-making aspects was, was the Bassmaster Classic. And, and dude, like I'm a huge fishing fan. Like I, I still, I watch every, every single day of Bass Live, you know, even when I'm fishing MLF I, and I'll watch, I watch every single day of MLF tournaments when I'm, when I'm not in them or knocked out or whatever it was at the time, like I'm just a huge fishing fan. So, um, and, and then, you know, obviously the, the pinnacle and the peak of professional bass fishing is the Bassmaster Classic. And man, I just, I, I gotta get back to one for sure. Yeah. I would love to see you there. Um, I have faith that I will see you there. Um, you see, you'll see me there, Mercer, and I'll give you a giant hug when I walk across that stage. I can't days. wait. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait. Because um, last time we saw each other, I think we were hugging, but it was yeah. on the dance yeah. floor late yeah, at night, true. and I was maybe inebriated, and you were sober <laughs> because you had to go to a freaking tournament the next day. I, mean, I got up at like four o'clock the next morning and I, I missed the day. I missed one day of practice for that, that event. I got up at like four o'clock in the morning and I drove 16 hours straight and it was brutal. Oh, but we made it happen. Well, you usually do make it happen, but, uh, dude, I'm excited about this challenge ahead of you. And, um, uh, I'm excited to see how it all works out. And, uh, I, I hope we can have many more conversations just like this in the future, except, on the elite series stage heck yeah i'm looking forward to it buddy and you like i'm gonna do the best that i possibly can to get there and i told like i told you uh a couple uh a few months ago when we were at, at uncle kevin's retirement party i said i'll be back so one of these uh you know whether it's this year or next year or, or whenever it might be but i promise you i'll be back that's a promise i look forward to you keeping because as you said pisses you off when people don't keep their promises so keep that damn promise that's right exactly <laughs> now it's on record <laughs> all right johnny get back to work actually do some work in that office all right buddy sounds good i appreciate it thank you there you have it the one and only jvd jonathan van damn 
Thank you for doing the show and congrats on your decision. Good luck on your quest to get back to the Bassmaster Elite Series. What he is doing is no easy task, but you've got to respect somebody who uh, risks the biscuit to chase what they need, and that is definitely what he is doing. Speaking of what you need and what you want, don't forget the BKK prize pack, the OCD collection of hooks. An incredible collection of hooks, and all you got to do is like, comment, and subscribe, and make sure in your comments you put BKK hooks, and you'll be officially entered, and this time next week we'll be announcing the winner of that prize pack. The gifts keep coming. It is the gift that keeps on giving, and it is the festive season. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody in the United States of America. Have a great week to everybody in the rest of the world. I am thankful for each and every one of you. Enjoy being, and as always, Bob Cobb, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe, because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear? <laughs>